Hey everyone, Temporal here, and today we are going to be doing a map guide. We will be reviewing Havana specifically, and we're going to be jumping back and forth here between some stat banana, as I'll explain how the map works, and some examples that we'll use in-game to show stuff, because, well, in the game at least itself to show stuff, as that can be a little better to see some of this stuff, see this flank routes. But we're gonna be looking at this, we'll be going over what are some of the common tricks, like the spawn hold as an example that you see here versus poke that you'd see here, some of the power positions, things like that, as well as how to beat it, what the lanes look like, really everything you need to know to sort of have some level of mastery of this map. If you guys are enjoying this content, it would really be huge if you could drop a like like and subscribe if you're not already subscribed if you'd like to see more of these see more micro or macro stuff in overwatch as well as potentially some other things but with that let's get into it oh and just as a quick reminder uh, I'll I'll deal with chat but I'll probably mostly deal with chat once I've gone through my initial presentation that usually takes 10 to 20 minutes so feel free to throw stuff in there I will catch up on you guys if you want to interrupt and get in there right now super chat is the way to do it so sort of the general principle of this map, and this is going to be a surprise to no one, you saw it in the thumbnail, is this map has really long sight lines. This, you know, in Stat Banana may be hard to tell, but this is a really long sight line right here. As we get to second area of first, the sight line length isn't particularly bad either. We've got some nice stuff from here. As we go to second, the sight lines are actually a little bit better, not quite as wild as first and third, but we do have some pretty long sight lines in play, and then we'll just jump over to third real quick where we can talk about this is a very long sight line for Overwatch. This is a very long sight line for Overwatch. This is a very long sight line. This is a long sight line. Like, these are some long sight lines without a lot of terrain to break them up, at least down main. So, yes, this is a powerful map for poke in a lot of ways. That does not mean that it is helpless for other comps whatsoever. Long sight lines with very little cover to use to rotate from spot to spot to allow a dive team to get a little closer to stage their dives, or to allow a brawl team to get closer to do their own staging, because they need to, they have better resources for getting through the open, but they still can't handle going through the open forever, does set them back a bit. That said, this is not, oh, it has to be poke all the time. Poke is the only way to play this map. Not by any means. And to start with, we're going to go to first, and we're going to cover what is one of the most common things. Uh, not most common things, but one of the common things, one of the things you need to look out for. It is very common for defenders to do a hold around here that is a spawn hold. They've effectively decided that the standard hold on Havana, well, it would be over here, and this is where the cart would sort of get stopped, that's a lot of distance to give the team. And you're not giving it to them for free. Defenders would be poking from here. Defenders would potentially have something set up over here. They'd have someone stuffing this out like a Sigma, whatever. And that's great. And it's a lot of time to chip down the advancing team, but it's a lot of cart distance to give the attacking team. So the spawn hold has become pretty common here. It's not going to happen every time you unladder or anything, but it's definitely something you should be aware of, and the spawn hold is going to be done with a brawl comp. It might use a Sim, a McCree, a May, you name it, but we're looking at a pretty standard brawl comp. And what we're talking about when we say a brawl comp would be something that looks roughly like one of these things right here. Cool. So, we're here, we're at this, we might see them using as uh, the defenders a TP to jump between the doors, that sort of thing. The trick to breaking the spawn hold if you're the attacking team is going to be to get one elimination and then not be a fool. The distance that their respawn has to travel compared to yours is huge. So if you get one elimination, you are going to be able to break it. Uh, if you're trying to break it with your own brawl, that's generally going to consist of putting posting your McCree or someone else, perhaps your D.Va, usually your McCree over here, and trying to break out with your own stuff. But really the easiest way to take down a spawn hold brawl these days tends to be swap yourself to pharmacy as the attackers, put pharmacy on roof, and then get a tracer or a ball actually behind them, which isn't too hard to do with those characters. And you should be able to whittle this down, find your elimination, don't be an absolute feeder about it. You should be able to recover, go for a second elimination. Spawn holds long over at that point. If that point, if you want to swap onto other heroes, great. If you don't want to swap onto other heroes, that's fine too. But this is sort of the first main event that you'd think about on this map. 
The next event that you might think about on this map is if the defenders were playing dive into you, it would be very common for them to stage someone up here. A monkey, a ball, a tracer, uh, Genji will pretend that he's still here that gets played. And that's something that you'd go, okay, we're pushing the cart, we're pushing the cart, we're pushing the cart. Oh no, we're getting dove on from here. While they have like a Zen or an Anna or something supporting them from here, maybe with a Brig, so she's not super vulnerable. Something along those lines. Not a big deal. Still not a big deal. We need to remember that there are in fact three lanes on this map this is a lane this is one of our lanes and we can from here with a flanker quickly push through and then we can pressure them from this side but we probably don't want it because if there's like a ball and a tracer sitting here we don't probably want to send our tracer in to go fight this so the key actually becomes unlocking our second lane and unlocking our second lane would be over here. If they're set up with some sort of divers in there, they can't really dive us into here. It's a closed space. They don't want it, even if we're running our own divers. And then once we put any level of poke over here, okay, we're pretty happy. We can now threaten this from here. It's not a good dive for them. We can threaten this from here here it's not a good dive for them and if we synchronize our timing with that to put a flanker behind here this is dealt with so that just leaves the final piece the final type of composition which is going to be a poke heavy composition which may be set up here maybe partially set up here partially set up here still not a big deal as you guys can imagine this is going to be more about using your flanker to use this flanker lane, this is lane is best for a flanker, to get past and then use this to shoot people down, to apply pressure, to do what you can in terms of turning the team. That's going to be your best way for breaking this. And obviously, against a poke team, don't actually rotate up here. You can have someone push the cart, maybe a Reinhardt, maybe a Diva, go back, recover resources. But your main rotation, if you're either a brawl or a dive team, is going to be to put your core here as you put your flanker behind them, and then you either dive from here or you rotate across under them and then go do your rotation like that. And I just walked you guys through the example here of how to sort of break the three comps, the spots that you need to be worried about for first fight. Now what I'm going to do is we're going to go to Sap Banana and I'm just going to highlight the lanes for you again. Because thinking of Overwatch in terms of lanes is actually really helpful and I think everyone should be able to do it. So let me go here. Try him. Okay, trying. Good. So obviously, first lane, we can draw that. That's not too wild. First lane looks like this. Cool. Main lane. This is boring. We don't really want to go do too much of this. Yes, this is the lane that the cart will take. It's not the most powerful lane for... The attackers, for example. Defenders don't mind shooting down at here like we talked about, but it is not the best lane for attackers. Instead, as the attackers, we talked about as a second lane, this over here, yes, it does allow us to come out. We talked about the ability to potentially loop back and push someone out. Though that's not actually what we're going to do most of the time. What we're more likely to do most of the time is use this second lane to get ourselves into here. And then from here, we can go high ground. We can go high ground and push out here. We can go uh, push out here, etc. But this is effectively our second lane. And the, th and the third lane is broken. And this lanes being broken like this is what actually causes people to sometimes not recognize that basically all of Overwatch has three lanes. And that's because this part of the lane right here is broken. There's not great cover between here and here. This is still the lane. Don't get me wrong, and it's still important, but this is a broken lane that we then get back to. I mean, I suppose I can highlight that part. We then get back to here, and if we wanted to... Oh, I'm not going to be able to move down any further. If we wanted to, we could continue this lane. We would go down to here. So... These are the three lanes for first point. As you saw, this yellow lane was very important for flankers, both for challenging any sort of divers over here, as well as for getting over and around on this team. This lane was pretty good for core. This purple lane, red lane, pink, uh, not purple, uh, reddish lane here is pretty good for core. This main lane is the carts lane. We don't really care about it that much as attackers. So then we get into what we'll call the second fight on first. It's not always going to be the second fight. Sometimes it'll be the fourth fight. Sometimes uh, it won't happen. There's things that happen. But generally speaking, if the attackers were to win every fight, one fight would happen around here, where I have highlighted, might instead happen about here, or could happen up here. But the next fight is going to happen when the card is somewhere in this-ish range. And the relevant things that we need to think about as attackers for here is that there are... A couple places that we might consider 
strong. And those places that we might consider strong are going to be this right here, which you guys can't see on Stop Banana, so I'll go highlight you. Widows can hide up here and aren't really accessible to your flankers. Even if you send a flanker around, send him down over here like this, they can tickle him from behind. They can't really get up there. Nor can flankers do a terribly good job at getting at them from here with like a bunch of blinks or whatever to get on a widow. So this is a strong place because it's hard to get access to. It's perfectly supportable by the defending team. It tends to give a widow, sometimes an ash, a fair amount of influence. She's got a nice long sight line here. We don't particularly like that. Okay, so what can we do here? Well, what we can do here in order to beat this position, and actually let's jump over and show you guys the position I'm talking about real quick, which is this right here. Widow can sit up here. She's got sight lines. Ash can sit up here. She's got sight lines. She can challenge things. That's a reasonably long sight line for her. Hey, we don't particularly like that. That's a problem. She can get support from a Zen, an Anna. She can be hit from her team. A Mercy can be up there with her. There's no real way for a Tracer, a Sombra to stage well on her. Like, yes, a Sombra can throw up and teleport up there. But then again, oh, in danger from the rest of the Widow's team. Widow's not really in much danger up here. So this is a good one. The other relevant power spot is this back here snipers can use this widows ashes hanzos you'll also see uh, supports like bap especially go up here bap is particularly easy access to it and again it takes forever for flankers to get up to this spot back here they have to find one of the routes to get up here and chase them out here or they have to find some way to go okay i'm going to dive from here i'm going to use multiple blinks i'm going to you know dash and wall climb whatever the case may be or hey we're going to go up here which is again our broken lane for this last part of this right lane to get to themselves to be able to use movement abilities to get up here so these are sort of the powerful positions for the second portion we'll say the second portion of first point and we do want to understand the best way to challenge this one in particular is generally going to be to get your own poke out aspect be that hanzo be that soldier be that whatever into a place where they can challenge from here so now you've got the ability to challenge here or to peek down and challenge here this is also powerful even if they haven't set up a widow a hanzo an ash whatever there though as it's going to create a situation where the defenders who are set up here who are set up here have a very extreme angle between main and between that poke aspect challenging if it's up there not challenging if it's here we do not see attacking teams that have won first fight and gotten control of this regularly enough get some sort of control up here and actually use the control up here. They will frequently go, oh yes, we've cleared the defenders out of here to win first fight, but then they, much more rarely than they should, do they use this as a new staging grounds for their poke, for their backline sometimes, you could put a Zen Brig up here, um, for that sort of thing. And using this will do a lot to win you this second fight, even if they set up with good stuff over here, with good stuff over here. Okay, uh, then we talked about that, winning second fight, getting control there, no problem. Then we move into second point. Second point can feel bad, but we're going to go ahead and start with the lane. Second point can feel bad for attackers because there's so much high ground, and the default path down to high ground sucks. You get spammed for so long trying to do this rotation for the default high ground path. It sucks. Like, you can get spammed so hard from so many directions, you don't have enough angles as you're rotating a high ground team across here. If it's a high ground poke team or a high ground brawl team, what are you going to do to them? You don't want to dive the high ground brawl team without setting up tons of angles. If you're trying to rotate your own brawl team, that just sucks. If they're a poke team, they're going to shred your brawl team before it gets in. If they're a poke team and you're running poke, well, you're trying to poke up, and poking up gives this team a huge advantage. So that seems like it should be really bad for the attackers. It does. I great except i will harp on how overwatch has three lanes overwatch has three lanes for basically everything havana second is wild havana second is wild in the number of lanes they give us so we can point out the default path down havana second which would be hey we're good let's go like this here's our default path this is the one the cart takes 
Fine. That's not actually the default path that most teams will take. Maybe a Brawl team would try to turtle on the point and push the cart through like this, but that's not really what's going to happen. A more default path of sorts would be, hey, let's go ahead and try to do this high ground rotation like this. Great. We've done this high ground rotation, and now maybe we go that way, maybe we go that way. Doesn't really matter. Could branch either way. Fine. Okay, so these are like main path one and main path two. Well, why am I not just calling them lanes one and two? Well, I'm not calling them lanes one and two because I want to put lane two over here. Lane two looks like this. And then it joins back up. But the fact that lane two can threaten in here, can threaten in here on high ground, or can threaten in here on low ground in a second place is quite powerful. And then it would go through and effectively take over as this lane, take over as this, whatever you want to do. This is quite powerful, being able to attack from the outside here. And if you have, have a team that is sort of bottlenecked themselves, right? I don't even want to use this color, but we'll do it. Bottlenecked themselves right here, holding with a poke comp, a brawl comp. The ability to threaten them from this this right here, if you get the timing right, yes, you're very close to them. Yes, a Brawl team could run you over. A Poke team could run you over too. But if you do it while your team is threatening this rotation here, it lets your team walk across as you back off as a Tracer, a Sombra. Even if you do something a little less mobile, if you threaten them from right here as your team is taking that fight, they don't have the ability to do that. So this is quite powerful, and it's not really something that they can deny you. If they go deny this lane, okay, well, they deny this lane, that softens them up in this direction quite a bit. But we're not done. We're going to get into another one right here, because this is not the end of the rotation options on this map. So let's go ahead and we'll use this black color. That's fine. We're going to look here and we're going to go, oh, wait, we didn't cover the ability to rotate like this. Which can turn into this or can turn into threatening that same spot. You know, say you've rotated yourself a Hanzo over here. Well, wait, now that threatens from over here. That that matters. That's something. Huh. Potentially isolated? Potentially punishable? Yeah, potentially. But against a stacked Brawl Comp or something like that, a little less so. And then what we've also got is yet another lane still, which I'm going to have to double up and use blue again because I'm out of colors. But this is a rotation. That puts us out here. One, two, three, four, five lanes. Like one, two, three. I'll do it from here. One, two, three, four, five lanes effectively here. It's not really five lanes. There are partial lanes, but our lanes have more branch off points and more ability to take angles than usual. So suddenly, instead of looking at this situation where, oh, this is almost impossible to get into, they have high ground, it's just not fair. There's like three high ground lanes, I agree. This would be one high ground lane right here. This would be a second high ground lane right here. And then this would be our third high ground lane. But the ability and the access we get in terms of we can threaten from here. We can do this. These ones aren't great, but what are pretty great is we can get here for free. We can pretty easily get someone over to here, and defending teams don't contest this. Defending teams don't contest this lane because they just don't have a way to do so. And now you have access to behind them. And could they have their own flanker? They absolutely could. But if the other team is running a flanker-heavy comp, you're a little less worried about their extreme poke or them just sitting up here where they can't be challenged as a brawl team. You're much less worried about that if they're a dive team. So you go, hey, they're being threatened from here by someone, and this can be a poke DPS in a lot of situations. You can put a Mercy Hanzo over here if you want. You can put an Ash over here. That's doable. And then you put something else. You put a Tracer. You put, uh, I mean, you could even put a Diva over here, etc. This sort of thing. Go, we're going to threaten this. And now you have your third aspect of, okay, we're potentially coming in from here with our core, or we're coming in from here with core, or we're actually trying to do the high ground rotation with core. And suddenly, this is not nearly as scary. Their high ground advantage that has a massive rotation to get into them is much, much more breakable. Um, okay, so that's what we'd look at here. 
Uh, Crunch, I am going to interrupt for your question. Why can't a Brawl Comp just come in through the high ground path on lane two here? And the reason for that is they could, but then they have to break a hard choke. This is a very hard choke that they have to break where the Reinhardt will have corner advantage. The Brawl team that's defending will have a little bit to punish angles first. And the team that's rotating in can't possibly have their back line out here where they do work. You see how this is such a sharp angle for this team? Like this team that's attacking, their back line basically has to be back here and can't be influential at all and their Reinhardt is having to round in and their backline is going to have to round in very quickly as well because there was no swing out here. The other thing that was the defending team, they got to hold their corner. That works quite nice for them and they could, if they wanted, put someone on the off angle here to punish from the other side and they can have their backline out here where their Zen, their BAP, their whatever gets to do the damage earlier. Okay. Um... That's going to be that. I see some other questions. I promise I'll get to them, guys. I know I'm taking a little longer than I expected to get through the initial presentation here, but I am going to circle back for your questions. I promise. So that's effectively the first fight on point two of this map. The second fight on point two is a lot less special, a lot less interesting. Obviously, much of these same lanes work. You can take advantage of the fact that this works. The most interesting aspect, I would say, of the second fight on map two is that once attackers win the first fight, if they win it at all cleanly, it actually is a bit of a pain for the defenders to get back in. They've got this pathway, They've got this pathway. Yes, this pathway then splits, and you've got the ability to go over here, the ability to drop out here, the ability to go this way. But this is pretty darn stuffable. This right here is pretty darn stuffable. Poke that is going to set up on things like this. This is a relatively powerful position. You'll see snipers, flyers playing around this, etc. And this just does such a good job of going, no, you really can't get back in. We really don't care if you come through here, here, or here. And we have our brawlier aspects over here. It's really rough to get back in on this map. It's not like, oh, you know, it's wild, the hardest thing to re-enter in the game. There are certainly harder parts in the map to re-enter after a lost fight. But that's the most interesting part about this second fight. Okay. Then we're going to go ahead and move on to point three. And point three is one of the two reasons. Oh, don't you dare shut down. No. Okay. Uh, one of the most interesting things that we run into on this third point is this right here, where this is a really long sight line. This is a really long sight line that the attackers effectively have to attack into because defenders are generally not going to hold up here. They might try to do a spawn camp after a one fight, but one of the reasons they'll do the spawn camp after the long fight is the same reason that it would happen on first. The card effectively gets to... Yeah, we'll do... Okay. Restart it. Works for me. The card effectively hits a thing where it would have to go too long before they'd be willing to stop it. Sure. Sure, Overwatch. Why not? Traveling to Havana. Okay, loading screen in the middle of my video. Why not? So, the reason that they'll potentially go for a spawn camp after a one fight here is, again, they're generally not willing to actually stop the cart until here. This is the first real stop on third point for defenders. Because if they push up here, they just get slaughtered in the open the same way they wanted to slaughter the attackers in the open so they go nope we'll take our fight here we'll get to soften you up where you don't have very good cover all the way up here and then this is where we'll make our stop and we'll have a huge poke advantage both because our angles are better we can have this as defenders we can have this as defenders we will have this as defenders we can have this as defenders the angles that the de defenders get are pretty huge whereas the attackers angles are like well we've got this maybe if we're smart we've got this and I guess we've got this. And if you aren't crushing us from there, maybe we can round this and we've got this. The angles for this is much smaller than the angle differential that we went over here. And for those that don't know, the team with bigger and more angles tends to win. Defenders definitely have the bigger angles here. So what do you do? Well, what you do is you recognize what are the lanes? There's three lanes here. There always are. Almost always are. So... Let's look at the lanes from the attacker's perspective. Well, we can draw our standard lane. Nothing too wild here. 
Okay. I don't think anyone's going to disagree with me that that is, in fact, a lane. Cool. Then we can get a secondary lane, and we can go, okay, we've got a secondary lane. It's a broken lane, don't get me wrong, but it can threaten through there, or it can circle through and threaten back through there. And then we have a third lane, which, don't get me wrong, it has more space in the open than we'd like, but it is a lane, and it takes us like this. And I'm going to fill these in so that people can see them, but there are broken aspects to them where they're not well protected, they're too easily... I mean. These aren't really broken, like they're broken in the sense that they're joined with the other lane and that they join with the blue lane in some ways. They don't have very good isolated covers. They're not isolated lanes by themselves. Blue sort of gets bigger and expands into them. You could think of it like that. And then these two sort of merge. But the point is, these two lanes sort of merging is okay if this is where the fight is happening. We're now in a situation where, hey, we can threaten this from multiple directions. And that is something that is incredibly relevant. Going, hey, this is a really long poke battle. We don't want to have to take this fight into here. We don't like it. Well, this fight gets a lot less scary. If you've gone, nope, we have a tracer in here with a harmony orb. If you've gone, nope, we've gotten a Hammond to circle back around here type thing. Now our Hammond is going to knock you in type thing. Oh, that's that's pretty good. That's a lot stronger, etc. Um you can obviously go, hey, we're going to take our own poke aspects, our own poke element. You do have the ability to go, we're going to take, this is one of the weird times that you can do it. We're going to take a full shield war with you while you've posted someone up out over here. Because this person is irrelevant while we do that. So that becomes another option. Not a super strong one, but an option. You can make this privileged position, this power position of sorts, mostly irrelevant. Because no, they're not going to come up here and try to punish you. And if they leave it to go here, well, that's fine. You had an advantage advantage as they were spending rotation time they weren't contributing they weren't getting picks all that good stuff so that's really what you're looking to do to break this first fight um and you'll notice i'm not recommending go full poke if you did you'd stack here make that irrelevant but what you are instead going to do is provide the support necessary to get someone up into here. And this is an opening that they're going across. So this isn't free. You can send an invisible Sombra. You can send a ball that can go fast. You can send maybe a Genji that has deflect. And then they're probably going to need help. Because if anyone was holding this, they're going to be here. Like there could be an Ash here that was trying to hold this sight line. Or an Ash up top that was trying to hold the sight line. If they're up top, that's a lot less of an issue. But even so, there's now a team over here, because they were probably holding here, that's going to shoot into it. So this rotation, while valuable, will require some help. Whoever's trying to earn this rotation, whatever, flanker, whatever, you're probably not going to be able to get an Ash, a Kree, a Hanzo in here that would be great, is going to need some help. They're going to need their pressure on core from your group. They're going to need pressure like a fair Rocket into here to help them go across. They're going to need a Harmony Orb. They're going to need something. But that's how you break this as your attackers. And then we move into what's probably the harder point, the harder part, which is the second fight on second. And what people get wrong here is they look at this and go, well, we just got to slam it down mid. We just got to slam the cart down mid. There's nothing we can do. It's designed with a huge defender's advantage. No, it's not. No, it's not. If you ever find yourself thinking about that, you're probably not actually thinking about the lanes. So here we are. We've got our standard lane, takes us down here. Now we have, okay, well, okay, fine, that's one lane, but you're not possibly going to be able to find us more than one more lane. Well, this lane works, and you can come in here, or you can come in back through here. And then you've got a third lane, because of course you have a third lane. And in terms of who you want to assign to these lanes, obviously blue will be your core in most situations. You're probably going to send a flanker down red here because the enemies are likely to defend either back here or up top here. And those are going to be accessible to your shorter range flanker. And then what you actually want to do is you want to have sent some poke aspects. Some um, Hanzo. Hanzo can actually shortcut and go there because he can wall climb. Or perhaps an Ash or perhaps a Widow or a Soldier or even a Kree. Or, and you can send a Mercy with them if you want to rotate up through here and then have this huge crossfire. This absolutely huge crossfire to break any sort of stronghold here. 
huge crossfire. Suddenly what they had that was supposed to defend them was supposed to make it almost impossible for blue lane to push here becomes, oh wait, I don't have anywhere to go. And this person is safe because this comp, these guys will have set up poke heavy in most situations. If they've gone super flanker heavy, sure, maybe that changes it a little, but they're mostly going to have set up poke heavy because this is such a strong poke defense map, except it's not. You can do work from here with a poke DPS on an off angle. Um, and I recommend you do so. Like, it's a big deal. Obviously, you can do things like get more complicated, send a diva on a route down main to try and knock people off, to knock them down for your flanker to get, for your blue lane to get, things like that. You can jump in with a dive comp. But none of that stuff is really surprising. Everyone understands that, yes, you can hit more standard dive stuffs. You could rotate these using these lanes with a dive comp in general and go, hey, let's send our monkey down yellow. Let's send... Tracer down red, and then let's have uh, Echo down main, and let's do our dive from three different directions onto this. Like, yes, that's a thing that you could do. That's fine. I wanted to explain this in the way that normally happens, because you'll often be running a lot of your own poke based on the nature of this map. So I think that just about covers the most important things. Um control of left side yeah yeah that's gonna cover what i think are the most important things on this map and just to show you guys what i'm talking about this is the lane over here again a hanzo could climb that anyone else is gonna go around over here and then they can threaten through there it's pretty darn powerful they could also uh have come in oh they can threaten through there like we said with the wall climb, if they don't want to threaten through there, they can come in and do this and then pretty quickly transition to here. And then they have an easy escape if they get into trouble, but they've also got the ability to punish that. So that's going to do it. Um, this map, hopefully that made it more clear to people. If it did, please do go ahead and drop a like, subscribe if you're not already subscribed. And if you guys have questions... Uh, throw them up in chat now. If you guys have a map that you would like me to do next, I recommend you leave that map as a comment in the section below. And maybe I'll go for the one that has the most comments or the most likes on the comment. No promise. Okay, so Crunch is continuing his prediction. Crunch is continuing his methodology of going, of putting his guess to what the answer is before I've done the video, before I've even started the video, which is the way to beat Havana is to be is be 100% accurate on Widow. Make sure to scream for a Mercy Pocket, and if Mercy isn't 100% blue beam beaming you, report for an activity gameplay, sabotage, and abuse of chat. That sounds like the correct solution to me. I don't see anything wrong with it. <laughs> okay. Val says, Temporal, how play attack Brig on Havana if I insist on picking Brig? Well, if you insist on picking Brig on Havana, what you're doing is you're saying, how do I want to put this? If you're playing Brig on Havana, you're not playing it with a Brawl Comp because your team is going to get slaughtered if they're a Brawl Comp on Havana because the opponents will be more likely will have poke aspects and Lucio helps solve a Brawl's weakness to poke by making them fast, letting them rotate through long sight lines faster, letting them rotate even through short sight lines faster so they get poked less. Brig is pure brawl like she doesn't actually have the ability to help them solve that instead she helps them beat dive by being a better brawler than divers are sometimes so she's not going to do very well if you're playing brawl into poke but assuming that she's playing in a poke or a dive comp what you're looking to do with your brig is really what you're generally looking to do you're looking to go let me help control my anna my zen's rotations let me help getting get them into the places that are relevant and let me make sure that we can't be shooed out by flankers and then I want to assist my flankers when they die. So you as Brig would go, you're part of on first point, the rotation to here in most situations, where either your dive core will be here or potentially your brawl team is going to rotate under. If you're on a poke team, not a big deal. You're still probably going to end up roughly in here. Then you would decide for second fight, are you going to go ahead and be back here helping your team, ready to protect your backline, whatever, or are you going to be greedy and rotate like your Zen or a Zen Sigma up to here or down to here to do a bit of threatening work? Can you help enforce allowing you to keep this place that's awfully close to the enemy team? 
So that would be it. Again, on this point, you'd be looking at, okay, you're part of the core rotation. That probably means you're going to end up here packing a team that's diving upwards. Or if your team is a little brawlier, your team is trying to rotate like it's a double bubble type comp. It actually needs its backline in play. You're either going to go up here or you could get sneaky. You could go do this and go, uh-huh, we're going to do that. We're going to rotate over here. And now we're going to come up from this direction. You could do that. You probably wouldn't. It makes your rotation shorter, but it doesn't make it enough shorter to to generally be worth doing but you could do that and then for third point i think we covered this again you'd mostly be playing cores brig so you'd look at this and you'd go hey i'm threatening from this i might throw a pack or even a double pack on my tracer as they're going through or my sombra as she unstealths to shoo this out to support them on a sombra to help her as she's trying to deal with a team from above over here that's something i do and again, same thing back here. You might be going, you know, I could watch my backline. They don't have any, they don't have any diver elements. So maybe I'm actually going to go forward and help out my Hanzo that's here and just sort of be a shield for him and let him do that sort of thing. It's a rare trick, but it's a trick that makes sense depending on the opponents that you're up against, depending on did they actually totally abandon any mobile heroes, etc. Which they frequently will frequently will on third point. Crunch says, here's how Genji can be meta. Step one, he can't. And that's in reference to yesterday's video on why Genji can't be meta. I recommend you guys go check that out. It is on the channel. Why can't a Brawl Comp just come in the high ground on path two, lane, second point? Or is that the actual preferred method? Yep, we covered that one already. What line would you suggest for Sigma? So I think Ego said that when we were on second point here. And what we are looking at is... Rotation for Sigma. So you absolutely could as Sigma go, hey, if you're off angling because you have a situation where you have someone else that is doing your main tank work, you don't have to play with core, great. You actually could go, hey, I'm going to be here, I'm going to flip over here, and I'm going to threaten in from here. And then once you've won this first fight, you're absolutely going to transition up to here because this is the place that you threaten. You're kind of worthless from over here. Your weapon doesn't reach where you need it to. You basically need to play here as Sigma for defending, as the attacker for defending the second fight, for not letting them back in, etc. You, again, could go, hey, we're going to stack all of our bears and try to do this stupid rotation across here, but I wouldn't recommend it. With Sigma, we're mostly interested in thinking about what range do we need. This range doesn't work for us. This range could work for us. We could play from here. We could play from here. We're probably not going to do a rotation all the way through here to get around behind and try to threaten like this, though, in theory, we could. Very easy to slip a nade to top of that door frame. Yep. Blizzard are hiding the knowledge. That's why they shut down the game. Exactly. Exactly. At Adam Nicholas... This is from Val. See, you were positioning wrong as Ash. There was a better spot. You just didn't know what it was. <laughs> Ouch, these two are going to continue their fight. Okay, okay. Uh, also, DPS bad, tech plus support good. I, I, I responded to that thread already, Valve. I responded to that thread already. Uh, Dragon Slayer. Okay, good to see you, Dragon Slayer. Uh, is Brig able to deny some of the high ground rotations on second point with whip shot? Able to deny some of the high ground rotations with whip shot. I mean, potentially, like if a team is trying to rotate as an attacker across here, yeah, they can have a Lucio ride around to the outside, knock them down. They can have a Brig potentially go, hey, you're trying, you're trying, you're trying. She's with her core. She's going to angle slightly and try to hit the whip shot, or even she's just going to knock them back. And even if they don't get knocked down, you have to rotate across this again. Yikes. You have to rotate across this again on this narrow, thin little thing when your opponents have this or perhaps have a little bit better of an angle on you because they have a little more, bit more space to fan their angle out. It sucks. Val, at Temporal, so Brig equals Overwatch Escort Mission. Uh, yeah. Yeah, basically. More often for your flex support, occasionally enabling someone else. But yeah, that's what she does. Now, when she has Rally, it's a little bit of a different story. She leads the charge, but most of the time she doesn't. She is looking to go, let me get people into positions and then let me enforce them having good positions. I'm not going to let you remove my friends from good positions, is kind of how Brig is thinking. And because I'm here, we can force our way into take good positions. We can brawl with softer backlines and take good positions because Brig has, you know, got some muscle to her. Okay. 
So that's really what we're looking at here. I can wrap it up here if there aren't any more questions. This was really, we'll say, our first map review guide. If there's something that you feel wasn't covered, like there's something you run into a lot that you feel wasn't covered, or you feel like, wait, 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 no, I don't want to know about lanes. I don't know want, want to know about common holds like... Um, I don't know. want to know about common holds like you're talking about here. I want to know about something else. I want to know about this more from the defender's perspective or the attacker's perspective or anything like that. Please do let me know. But I'm not seeing any more questions. Oh, how to remove common widow spots. Sure, sure. How to remove common widow spots. So we talked about this common widow spot already. And the best way to remove it is to get your own poke aspect up here where they can jump between these two portions of the lane. So they can jump between here and here. Uh, and if we jump back into our Overwatch map for that, what that looks like is... The widow's here, and this is a common spot. You remove her by ha rotating your person up to here so that they can threaten from here or here, though this is more dangerous, while your core is here-ish so that you have angle differential on that widow, and that widow's like, well, do I want to shoot here or do I want to shoot here? Do I want to shoot here, or do I want to shoot here? You can send a flanker, a tracer, a sombra, a genji around to try and get this, but most of them are then going to have trouble getting up here to go actually mess with her. They're either going to have to throw a translocator up, or genji would have had to get across that long opening, which is challenging for him, even if he can then wall climb up here. But he'd have to not get shot while wall climbing up here, and he's going to by the team that's defending really behind the widow in this situation. There will be like a zen or a bap or something back there that he won't like. So that doesn't work too well for him. Um, widows can also play from here. This is relatively challenging uh you basically use that same angle that we're talking about in terms of over here differential between here and here can be pretty good you can at this point send a flanker around send a flanker around and have them come through to deal up here that's absolutely doable if you win this lane hard or sneak through mid you can send someone up here and that'll instantly shoo any support or widow that's here out to down here you can also use some of the more standard stuff of okay well there's a sonic arrow widow do you want to stay open or do you not want to stay open and she doesn't really have anywhere great to transition to if she was positioned here so that's one thing that you'd look at other common widow spots would be i talked about this can happen with snipers snipers can set up looking in either direction on top of this and this is the sort of thing where you go hey there's about a bajillion lanes on this point so you just overwhelm them with directions and there's about a bajillion lanes like if you take the basement lane okay well She's not going to be able to keep track of you. If you go outdoors, you could show up there. You could show up there. You could also come through there. She's not going to be able to do an amazing job. And because Widow's health pool is low, even a little bit of chip damage makes her either go, oh, shoot, I need a support to full on babysit me or I need to leave when she takes really any meaningful chip damage. And then we talked about the third point, the most powerful Widow spot. You'll sometimes see Widow's up here. That's annoying, but you should be able to force a Tracer, a Hammond, something through up here, and then they can recharge, and then they can fight this quite easily. The other annoying Widow spot is here. You either make it irrelevant by stacking your team here for a poke battle, or what you end up doing is you go, when we get to fight over this point, we're going to potentially get our own poke aspect that is going to go take the spot here and if you have like a bap with your core and a hanzo here or a zen with your core and a hanzo here you're going to be fine this is going to be less good for getting a tracer or a ball through to come up up here though you could do a ball or a diva sort of u-turn type thing to try to knock him out Adam says, is it sad that my thirst for Overwatch knowledge in the present state of the game is minimal because I have no clue how the game will be played without a second tank plus the other changes? It's hard to know, but a lot of this stuff will carry through. A lot of this stuff could have been applied to Overwatch at the very beginning and took years for people to figure out. Not this stuff. I mean, and I figured it out instantly because I'm perfect. No, I'm kidding. I didn't get it instantly. Just faster than everyone else. Um... What I would say about that is things are going to change. Don't get me wrong. Things are going to change with only one uh, with only one tank, with some of the maps being designed a fair bit differently. But I think they're not going to betray some of these principles. And, okay, do you know exactly which ones? No. But 
you know, if like 70% of your knowledge is still good, that's, that's a pretty big head start on everyone else. If 80% of your knowledge is still good, that's a pretty big head start on everyone else. And most of what we're talking about here isn't like specific ability interactions or cooldown timers or exactly what the ability does change. Like this year was pretty map specific and to the best of my knowledge, they're not fully removing these maps from the pool. They're just adding a bunch of maps. I mean, they'd have to do a ton more work if they were gonna remove these maps from the pool. So like a map knowledge series, that's still gonna be useful even if there's one less tank on the board. So yes, it might challenge how change how lane strength determinations happen, as you can't put two people on each lane, for example. Not that that's exactly what you did even now. The trick is to understand the under is to understand the underlying concepts, not the absolute facts. It's just sad that I love the idea of gameplay now that I understand it. The idea of the gameplay is amazing. Like this, this was a very polished, well done game, guys. It really was, is whatever you want to think about it. There. Okay. I think we're good there. Again, if you guys enjoyed the content, please do like and subscribe. If you have a map that you'd like me to cover next, to leave that as a comment in the section below. And uh, I hope to see you guys in the next one. Thanks. Tempora Lab.